got it. All right. Uh, do we want to wait a minute? Hi, everybody. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Who's that? Is that you, Omar? Yes. Oh, Ryan Dehaney. How you doing? Came on video. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're gonna meet you guys all in a couple of minutes. So uh, let's, you know, say hello to everyone. Uh, I know more people will probably be jumping in as we go along. Um, Jason, do you think... have a, a presentation you'd like to share on screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, I have something I want to share. Okay, great. Let's do this. Okay, Jason, we'll give it a couple of minutes, and then we can. Uh, no problem. Whenever you're ready. So what are we talking about today? What do you I know you got some exciting stuff for us? <laughs> no, my stuff is boring. Like like it's just mortgages and money and interest rates. Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You have like the aesthetic backdrop behind you, like perfect for Zoom yeah. meetings. <laughs> you know what? I have to thank my fiance for that. So it's not, you know, she was seeing and she was like, What are you doing? You know, we spent in Zoom, what, two years now? Yeah, two uh, years in Zoom. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mike, remember two years ago, we canceled our um, our master class. Remember, of, we were just like, we're going to do it because of the pandemic, and we thought it would be short. And and remember, we're in the middle of the podcast, and we found out Kobe died. Yes, that oh, happened, too. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget that moment. Yeah. yeah, that was funny. I thought PK was joking. I know, right? Okay, okay. All right. So we can get started, Jason. All um, right. Perfect. Let me let me quickly do the introduction. So Jason Allen John is a um I mean he does he does, he does a lot of things around finances. He's a mortgage broker, he's opening up a fund, he's a builder as well. Um I've been working with him, he's an investor. I've been working with him for a few years now. Yeah, we've 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 worked together for a few years, done a few deals together um got a few more deals in the pipeline as well he's one of my you know my uh, board of directors when it comes to the business of real estate uh, i trust him a lot he, I, lo I love his insight and the market uh, and he keeps it very real and he's very experienced so jason looking forward to what you have to share i'm going to put myself on mute and off video and then i'll come back after okay thank you mike for that introduction it's really nice of you Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I don't, um, I'll just tell you guys a little bit about myself and I'll put up my presentation. Um, so you guys have that one second. So as Mike mentioned, my name is Jason Allen John. I'm a mortgage uh, broker. I work for a company called the Mortgage Group. And um, what I do is essentially specialize in um, working with individuals, mostly people that have access to equity already. Like, obviously, I do work with first time home buyers, but my main um, sense is working with individuals that have um, properties or access to capital and they want to maximize that. And I look to look at individual situations and try to see how we can get the most out of it. So if you have a potential client and they're looking to have multiple homes, I try to develop a plan that can navigate through the mortgage process that will allow clients to buy multiple homes in the, in the right process. Um, on top of it, um, I'll just get into a little bit about myself. So um, I've been in the banking industry for over 20 years. Um, I started off co-op at Bank of Montreal and um, I've been where I worked my way up from there. Um, and then I since transitioned over to the mortgage world. First started off at BMO and then CIBC. And then um, I meant I moved over to Mortgage Alliance. I've done over $300 million in mortgages. Um, and, you know, my passion is helping customers build equity, as I said, empowering the missing middle community. And also, I love architectural design and macroeconomics, which we're going to get into some stuff about macroeconomics, which I feel is important um, in regards to this. So I also want to say if anybody has any questions, uh, you could put a question in the chat or just um, interrupt me if you have to. Um, I have no problem with that. And if I guys don't understand anything I'm saying and you want me to repeat it, let me know. Um, sometimes I get a little bit excited and passionate, so I get excited about this stuff. So, <laughs> all right, so let's get into it. So 
Yesterday, the big news, everybody was like Bank of Canada raised rates, interest rate hikes. Um, we hiked rates from 0.25% uh, to 0.5%. Um, this rate hike, everybody knew it was kind of coming. Um, it was no shock. Um, as you know, uh, as you're seeing from the grocery stores and even in the prices of real estate and stuff, inflation is um, really hitting us. So a way to combat inflation is a tool that Bank of Canada uses is by increasing um, rates. And the reason why they will increase rates is to, um, in some ways, offset demand. Because if rates increase, people will make uh, different decisions when they make uh, purchasing decisions, such as buying a home or maybe purchasing a car. So one way to either stimulate the economy or slow down the economy, the Bank of Canada plays around with the interest rate. So right now they're trying to slow down the inflation. So one way of slowing down inflation is raising rates. So what's the current state of the market? We're anticipating that there's going to be a 100 basis points increase over the next four to five um, rate cycles, which probably will take place over the next 12 months, which would bring prime from 2.7% to 3.7%. So that's a 1% increase, right? Right now, the five-year fixed rates are floating between 2.99 and 3.5 for conventional mortgages. And to think about it, like a year ago, we were looking at like 1.99 and in some cases a lot lower so interest rates have increased significantly on the insured side so that's for people that are going to be putting less than 20 percent down um we have mortgage interest rates are looking at five-year fix at 2.59 to 2.99 the variable rates are at prime minus 0.7 to prime minus 0.1 and prime right now it should be 2.7 i'm sorry that was my mistake it's not 2.45 it's 2.7 it went up yesterday a quarter percent as we discussed right so based on a rate increases that we're anticipating fixed rates will now be in a range between 3.7 and 5 percent if rates go up on that trajectory going forward so as you can see that can be a, a huge increase in rates and it could affect individuals purchasing power because i believe a lot of people purchase more on their monthly payment and less on the purchase price of the house, especially in this market with bidding wars. So as interest rates go up, people's purchasing um, what they want to spend on a monthly payment on their mortgage could change. So um, my thoughts on the market is, I don't think rates will go up more than three times. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure on, uh, on the actual global markets right now. And I don't think Bank of Canada will be able to raise rates more than three times. Um, and I do think inflation will start cooling um, in the next few months, as we will see. Um, there's something called the yield curve, which is basically a mix between uh, the 10 year fixed rates and the two year fixed rates uh, that is starting to invert or get closer, which means that um, the anticipation for long term rates are actually going to be lower than the current short-term rates so which is a sign of a recession or it could be uh some bad tailwinds ahead in the future so i still think customers should choose variable rate however i have a strategy which i tell a lot of customers is that they should take variable rate but actually pay as if it was a fixed rate so what i mean by that is like say today right now a customer is getting prime minus 0.5 percent so they're paying 2.2 percent they should really pay as if it's like 3.2%. So then as rates do go up, they don't feel the shock, but they're going to feel the benefit of the savings of the interest rates in the short term. Um, because um, when interest rates do go up, especially people that take variable rates, uh, what happens is the banks usually don't inform you right away. Like, so you see how prime went up. The bank doesn't send a letter to all their clients and say, hey, you know what? Your variable rate's gone up by a quarter percentage point. They don't do nothing. So they wait like a year or so and then like on the mortgage anniversary and then they'll send the letter to the customer and say hey you have to make up these payments because now your amortization is higher than you are contractually so either customers payments will go up by a large amount or they or they'll have to put a lump sum down to catch up to their mortgage so it's very important for homeowners to like be aware of that and prepare for that. So it's, you may need to put some lump sums. And if any of you guys have a variable rate mortgage, it's something to think about um, as we're navigating the next few months. Because you just don't want to be sticker shocked when the bank sends you a letter and say your payment's going to go up by $700.
Um, so we're talking about that yield spread. So this is the Canadian yield spread. And I took a chart that is basically, um, it's the max chart. So it's almost about 22 years. And you can see any time that, if you remember, so 2001 recession, uh, dot com era, 2008, as you know, the financial crisis in the US and over here. And then also we have the recent one, which was uh, the pandemic, where, uh, where, the, where the yield curve was inverted, which meant a recession. And it looks as if we're on the way down. So we're not there yet. Things can change at any moment. But based on this, it's it's like, if you could see, it looks like we're going to possibly go into more difficult time periods, which will restrict Bank of Canada's ability to raise rates, um, which will, in my my opinion, will continue to fuel the housing market because it will keep mortgage payments low. So, uh, sorry, I went backwards. And then also, this is I wanted to show you guys. This is the U.S. Uh, ten to two yields, uh, Treasury yield spread, and it's very important that we pay attention to what's going on to U.S. because unfortunately, Canada we're not a very big market. So a lot of those things that go on, like, for example, the last time Bank of Canada met, everybody thought they were going to raise rates, but they didn't. And the reason why they didn't raise rates, because the states wasn't ready to raise rates. And it's also the banks, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Canada is in constant communication. So they usually move in step. Right. So as you can see, it's the same thing going on in the states. It's fallen sharply and it's getting very low. So it could be a signs of recession in the future. So my thing for uh, all of our customers right now is that we have to pay attention to a couple of things. Like it's important to review a client situation um, right now. A lot of people have increased equity values. Um, so people could do a lot of things. Like, you know, I have a lot of clients that are in uh, insured mortgage where it's like 25 year amortization. We've refinanced them to 30 years so they could get breaks on their payments. That's a good thing. A lot of customers are tapping in to refinance and to stay liquid, um, to be an advance of any sort of moods. Um, I think clients can do a lot of things like upgrade and sell, uh, refinance and upgrade refinance and invest or even consider something uh, that I like to talk about, which is the Smith maneuver, which is a way that um, we could make our mortgages tax deductible. So I think um, clients should take the opportunity right now to look at, you know, a variety of things and options that, uh, that come, come available to them and take advantage of the equity that has come into our properties because we don't know what's going to be happening in the future and how long will it stay like this. So if you have a combination of rates going up and also, um, you know, lack of supply or let's say people can't afford to qualify for the mortgages, um, you're going to have a situation where there might be a lot of opportunity. So if we get our customers prepared by taking out their equity in advance, and they're going to get it locked in at a lower rate, or they'll have a manageable variable rate that they could take forward into the new in the new year. Now, a couple of other things that I want to talk about that is probably going to also happen potentially in the future. I can't see the variable rates discounts going away. So they've had that before. So right now, clients can get either like a fixed rate right now, like I said, of 2.99, or they could get a variable rate like prime minus 0.7. Right. What's going to happen as this period of rate compression happens, the banks are going to remove that discount on that variable rate. So you're going to see that instead of seeing prime minus 0.7, you're going to see prime or prime plus 0.5 or prime plus 0.1. You're going to start seeing those rates start popping up. So what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to decrease the discount on the variable rate and then also increase the fixed rates. So even if Bank of Canada doesn't raise rates, there's a possibility that rates can still go up in a sense. Even though the, the bond yields are kind of falling, the banks can say that their cost of funds is going up. So their cost of funds is means how much they have to pay to get the money that they lend out is going up and, and that can affect rates as well. So even though um, we could be in a recessionary period where we think rates can go down. They can also kind of go up at the same time. So it's a good idea right now in the environment we are in that everybody take an opportunity to time to to look at their equity position to position themselves for any future moves that they're trying to make. Because I think it's a great opportunity with the mix of where the values are 
where people can get a lot of good money, tap it out in refinances and need to take that capital and buy some more properties or, you know, take advantage of moving selling their property and moving to a new property and resetting, especially people who have like, you know, maybe they paid their mortgage down for five years, six years, they can reset to a 30 year amortization. So even if they go get a higher mortgage, um, their monthly payment won't change that much. So I just want to talk about what is the Smith maneuver. So the Smith maneuver is a creative legal financial strategy that's designed for Canadians to convert non-deductible debt of a house mortgage to the deductible debt of an investment loan. So this simultaneously ensures the elimination of your non-deductible mortgage in record time while building a free and clear non-registered personal pension plan and enjoy sustainable tax returns for years and years to come. So the Smith Maneuver, what it does, it kind of like um, what a client would have to do is really set up one of those uh, mortgage line of credit products where they have a product that as the mortgage goes down, the line of credit goes up. And in that sense, it gives them the ability to withdraw those increases of that line of credit and invest it into whatever, whether it's another real estate property, whether it's real estate investments, whether it's into their, um, their stock portfolio, maybe someone wants to buy dividends or crypto or whatever. But now what happens is that line of credit becomes tax deductible. So if you manage it in a correct way, you can actually do something very special and um, be able to pay down your mortgage fast while increasing your investment. So I'm going to show you guys a little example of the Smith maneuver, um, just um, just so you guys understand it a bit more, because I know sometimes explaining it is complicated. But hold on. So we have a I have a calculator that I have, um, and myself uh, because I was so interested in this. I became a certified Smith Maneuver mortgage broker. So there's a calculator that they have that kind of um, discuss the Smith Maneuver and I'm gonna put it in in general. I'm gonna go over this very quickly, guys. If you guys want a more like detailed example, we'll have to sit down and it always works better to have a live example of a customer or someone. I just made up this situation for myself of like, you know, what I see average clients, right? So this person, um, his name is Jason Allen John, so it's me. <laughs> um, he makes $135,000 of household income. Um, he has a one rental property that he makes $35,000 a year. And the rental expenses is $20,000. And then he also has a side business where he makes $25,000 a year. And I include these variables because these are some of the things that allow you to use the Smith Maneuver to actually pay the mortgage down a lot faster. So we go through the calculator and we just kind of go through the next and we just talk about the um, mortgage information. So Jason has a house is valued at a million dollars. The mortgage balance is 713. His interest rate is 2.99 and his current amortization is 25 years. So basically that's his monthly payment, $3,300 a month basically. And um, he's going to have the re-advanceable line of credit is going to be at the prime. I put it here at 2.95 and it's plus 0.5, right? So the rate's 3.45%. So now you go through some assumptions. So let's say I invest my extra money that I have in the Smith maneuver in an investment portfolio, and it grows at 8% a year. Right. The other thing is, too, is that, as you know, a mortgage payment is made up of principal and interest. So in every payment of my mortgage right now that I'm making, there's one thousand two hundred and sixty seven dollars of principal. So what I'm going to do with that principal, I'm also going to continue to invest that into the market. So every month. Right. And um, I'm put the limit at eight hundred thousand, the max limit I can get. So the breakdown is you have $150,000 of non-advanceable, uh, $563,000 of, of non-deductible debt. And then we have about $87,000 available to like put down onto my mortgage right away to, to make it go faster. Now, debt swap is basically if you have extra money, you could put it down as a lump sum. I didn't indicate that I put it down as all. And I also didn't say that I'm using any of my emergency cash to pay it down faster. Um, cash flow diversion, which just means like if I might, how much money am I putting into the mortgage? So basically if, you know, you have a client that's saving or, you know, I'm saving my money, I'm going to divert my savings to pay down my mortgage first 
and then invest instead of saving first. So I, I basically said I can do like an extra $1,500 a month to pay down my mortgage or sorry, to invest. So um, there's also talking about using the rental income to actually accelerate it. So what that means is that you would put the rental income that you get onto your mortgage first, pay it down. And then when in the line of credit, you use the proceeds from the line of credit to pay your mortgage payment and any expenses in your rental property, because that's a form of investment. So it's a way to speed it up and make your mortgage tax deductible too. And then we talk about dividends. If I took my money and I invested into like a dividend portfolio and I was getting 4% a year, I would just reinvest those dividends. So it just, this is a calculation to make it work. And then, like I say, prime to pump, I'm not doing that at all. So long story short, I know that was very winded, but if we, if I do it, then I get a tax improvement of savings about 232,000. I could pay my, my mortgage off in, in 19 years. Sorry, I could trade my mortgage off in basically six years and I saved 19 years by doing this. My net worth has improved by 5.9 million because what that means is that we're, we're, we're hoping that that investment fund that I invested in, I'm getting 8% uh, is growing over the 25 years that I, what I would have. So the net value of the Smith Maneuver to me is like 4.6 million, right? So, and then this kind of just shows a number like, you know, the income that you would need to pay off your mortgage without the Swift Maneuver, which is 1.8 million. So that kind of just gives like a little example. And I could just show you guys kind of in a graph how that looks. So you could see the red is kind of the investment portfolio. You know, you have a, you have a loan that kind of stays stagnant that doesn't really ever move. And then this is your, um, your mortgage that just kind of disappears. And then now you do have debt. So this is not something where, you know, you're just getting rid of your debt. You're still going to have debt, but what that debt is, it's now tax deductible. So now this is good debt. So um, I see a question here. So which banks? Yeah. So Scotia Step is a good one. Any bank that has a mortgage line of credit. So every schedule one bank has one. B2B also has it too. Um but um, this is mostly like me personally, most of my clients, I put them into Scotia Step to do it because Scotia Step is really good and it's convenient. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to, I guess I have one more page in my presentation that's just like a finalization. Yeah, so overall, thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions or anything, like we can go. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes it's a little detail oriented, but Smith Maneuver I think um, it's something that you guys should consider to talk to your clients about, especially in this environment, because it's a way to make uh, your mortgage tax deductible and, you know, utilizing that equity. And I think it gets people utilizing equity and feeling comfortable with like real estate investment and stuff like that and taking advantage. Because I always say the equity in your house can't pay you, you know, and the only way you can get value off of it is if you borrow from it or you sell your home. So we, we, we should get, have our, have people take advantage of their equity, you know, while it's available and especially if they don't want to move, because, you know, like if you don't take advantage of it, prices could fall and then you won't be able to take out as much you could before. And then maybe at that time, you're going to take care of advantage of opportunities or like, as we're seeing interest rates are going up. So the payments could go much higher. So now's the time that people should be tapping into what they have available to try to get into the market as the interest rates stay where it is. So that's my presentation. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Jason. Uh, do we have any questions? I think Ryan Dehaney. Ryan, do you have yeah. yeah, definitely. Sorry, I'm at Starbucks. It's a little noisy. Um, but I, I have a question. So I have potential clients who mm -hmm. do have equity. Uh, they're not very, they're not savvy in terms of investment so yeah. they're going to be looking to me definitely to, to, to lead them um when i first i guess this, the question is kind of both you and mike so first of all how do i how do i begin to talk about um uh, breaking the mortgage versus the renewal mm -hmm. um and also do, do we go is it is it good to go heloc or refinance okay so two things i'd say on that one i would say right now in most cases, it's better for customer to go um, refinance over HELOC 
because if they do take the money and they're going to be purchasing like another property or a rental property, it's sometimes easier for us to qualify them when they have a mortgage because HELOCs, um, HELOCs uh, are, are actually like their payments, the way we do it on the back end, we have to stress test them. So it makes it harder to qualify for the mortgage on the stress test amount compared to if it's like an actual dollar amount. So one, I would say that. And then um, two, what I always say to customers when they're very hesitant in taking out equity, I always show them that if they don't like it and they don't want to do it, if like sitting in a year, they looked at all available investment options and nothing comes available, they could always put the money back on their mortgage, right? They'll maybe spend a small penalty but if they do it strategically it probably won't cost them that much and then i always give them the comparison as if they didn't do the investment are you fine paying like a few thousand dollars to 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 just take the opportunity to try and do an investment as opposed to not doing anything okay thanks that, uh, that helps okay uh i think hugh hugh has a question and then salome i don't know if you still have a question uh we can address that after actually he answered my question while answering the other one so i'm okay for now okay perfect okay. i'm clear as well thank you so much okay okay any other questions forward your contact information please yeah <laughs> i will give you that right now I'll put it in the chat um no problem and yeah, it's like, and Mike knows this, if you like, I'm pretty good at talking to people to take out, like when they want to try to take out equity, especially older individuals that have capital. I've been good at convincing um, parents to give kids money for down payment. Because the thing about it is, this is a trick. This is the big trick, right? This is what I tell everybody. So let's just say your child is going to put less than 20% down, right? The CMHC premium is like 4%, 5% sometimes, plus HST. So I always say to parents, I was like, you want to give the government $30,000 for no reason? Like, they can pay you that money. Like, why would you want to give the government the money? So when people start realizing the cost in the other end and saying like, oh, my God, I can help and I can actually make money off of it, it, it I think that works well. And then also, it's like key to tell people like you can't tell the bank that this isn't like an investment, but why not like get group money together and sell it to people? Like if you're going to help me with my down payment or something like that, or co-sign with me, it's also an investment with you. Like we can help work out numbers and situations that can demonstrate that it's an investment because as we've seen with real estate, like you can make a lot of money, like return on your, your, the middle little money that you put in as a down and the value that can go up. So, you know, it's a, it's a, honestly, it's a great way, especially people who are like scared of rental properties. If you like, if I was like, okay, my family member, my brother, or my sister rents forever, like might as well just buy a property and then they can be my tenant. And then I could, uh, benefit off the increased value and then they could benefit too. You might be able to just give them back their rent money and still benefit, right? So there's so much stuff. I think the way people are very scared at tapping in their equity because honestly, like, you know, especially older generations in the 90s, we went like almost 15 years of no growth in real estate. So for go from that to this, they don't know that experience. So you just have to educate. And the other thing, just another tip that I've been telling people a lot why don't you take that increase that has happened in the last, that pandemic bump? You know what I mean, Mike? So it's like, like just if you thought your house was worth 500 and now your house is worth 800, take the 300,000 and invest it. You never thought your house was going to be worth that much anyways. Like what's the risk? Like what risk are you really taking? Right. It's not money you never had before. So that's that. That's just stuff that I use to sell all the time. So I'll put my contact information. I said I was going to do that. And here you go. Another question. Yeah. So um, I have some clients who want to refinance, mm -hmm. um, but to invest in markets outside the GTA. So I just wanted to get your commentary on lenders and their view on financing properties outside of the, the Golden Bush. To be honest with you, there's a couple of great lenders right now. Like even if customers have problems qualifying that are basically lending money privately, in a way with like no money, no income documents and stuff. So I think there's an opportunity outside of the GTA 
you know, I, I think uh, like you have to bring your money where it's going to work for you the best. Like I, I like obviously investing in Toronto myself, but we have, you have cost restraints with down payment and flexibility. So I think the key in that is if you're going to do it outside is just, you know, property management for the client. But as far as financing, you can get a lot of great financing no matter what. And the thing is we also, as brokers, we work with credit unions too. So sometimes I've done and I've worked with a local credit union to get financing done for a customer in a, like an obscure area that doesn't have a, a lot of uh, um, population or something like that. But most of the times lenders are right now, it's a weird situation. I don't know. It's a great situation. The lenders have a lot of money. There's a lot of money floating around and people want to lend this money. And, you know, so there's a lot of private money, investment money, money that people want to do renovation. So I think it's just about presenting opportunities and you'll find a home as long as the customer is willing to pay the price. Sometimes people don't want to pay B lender rates or fees or stuff like that. But I think if you could kind of like um, combine it into something that is a good package, people will respond well. Do, do A lenders... Well, A lenders lend to both markets. Yeah, honestly, A lenders are sometimes the best. Like I had a deal the other day on, um, it was in um, North Bay, my client. And it was like a weird situation because they bought a house and it had like two pins on it. So um, First National, which is not like, well, is an A lender, but a quasi A lender. They wouldn't do the deal because they had the two pins. But then I took it to Scotia and Scotia like did it in like 10 days. So sometimes like the A lenders are easier because they can lend anywhere. They have jurisdiction everywhere. Their only concern is, is when it's like an obscure, like weird area and you don't have all season access. The key for A lending is making sure you have all season access. Otherwise, it's like you could basically get a loan anywhere as long as customers can qualify. Okay. No, that's great. One other question. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have a, a deal on the table right now, and I'm hearing from a mortgage, a person that I deal with now, that some of the lenders are scared when they see a property that is not properly finished. So, you know, sometimes, uh, for example, the one I'm in now, the carpet wasn't there, there's holes in the drywall. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing stories, and I don't know how true this is, is that, that lenders are turning down deals for, you know, something as simple as hole, a hole in the drywall or, you know, missing flooring is that kind of are you seeing any of that stuff right now well that okay so the big thing about properties for lenders is it is it livable so you don't want a property that even looks like not livable so what you're telling me is not stuff that is that that doesn't matter but what i would say to you is this everybody's deal is different and sometimes lenders decline stuff has nothing to do with the property and has everything to do with the customer and they don't want to say like it could be multiple stuff right and they don't want to say the truth sometimes like even when i used to work at bmo it'd be a situation where bmo lent too many loans in that area and they're overexposed and they just decline a loan for no reason and they find a way out and maybe they looked at the appraisal and it had like a, a rough spot and they're like ah that's our out we're going to use it and there's nothing you could argue with it about right so it's very delicate and this is why it's honestly it's a difficult time to be a mortgage broker because like you know what i mean like mike we know this like no conditions appraisals waiting last minute like mike doesn't even want me to go into the last customer we just dealt with right and it's like we didn't know like literally we did an appraisal mike what november and then i did one in february and the value was like four hundred thousand three hundred thousand dollars different and it changed the whole scenario of the customer and what they were doing so it's like any it's like it's it's right now it's the wild wild rest so what's important is does can what can the customer qualify for? Because more than likely, we're not going to get an appraisal before signing off on conditions. You're not going to get an inspection. So you have that's why I was saying early in the presentation that if people need to do refinances or they need to take out equity, let's do it now. Let's not wait till the property is closing and doing it because Mike will tell you it's, it's headache. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I guess we might as well bring the team on the on, on the story because um, yeah. so I had a client and our intention was to sell the property, but I was also nervous because I know Jason is very good in terms of convincing and structuring clients so that they don't sell their properties and they keep the property so they can do more investments. 
So there was a, a lot of energy put into preparing this listing that never ended up happening. Uh, so that's kind of the inside joke in terms of, you know, this property was appraised at 1.1 million when the, um, the client bought a property and they were looking to refinance from other properties to, um, to be able to purchase something else. The refinance came in at 1.1, which didn't make sense for what the client was looking to do. But the closing for the new property that the client bought wasn't for 100 days. So in that time period, the market had appreciated over $300,000 and then it became a no brainer uh, for the client to keep the existing property and just keep you know, leveraging and buying more properties. Uh, but it was just the conversation. And that's, that's a very important thing. There's a couple of points that Jason touched, touched on, uh, which is convincing parents to lend you money. You know, and I'm, and I'm so glad that you spoke about it because most of the sales reps here let's say average age, you know, 35 to 42. Um, so, you know, they're now in the category of this is what, this is the age bracket of what first time home buyers now look like today. You know, first time home buyers are not 19, 21 years old, uh, 25 years old anymore. They're in their mid thirties to late, uh, late thirties, early forties. And even with that, even with strong incomes, you know, they don't have the down payment necessary to be able to, you know, make the purchase and all, even if their incomes are strong. I mean, I have tenants that when I look at their earn, you know, their earnings, you know, 250,000 household income and they can't, they can't buy in the market, not because they don't qualify on the income, but they just, the, the rate in terms of what they have to save to be able to get in the market, even with a strong income is very, very challenging. So having a conversation with your, you know, with your peers, your associates, your friends, around why they should have a conversation with yourself and Jason Allen John or someone in that space that is very seasoned and understands how to pull equity and pull income from different sources is going to get you a lot closer to be able to do what you need to do. So Jason, I'm glad that you that you brought up that point. Um, any Any other questions? No, shy, shy crowd this morning. Uh, Jason, so we know where we can find you. We have your, um, your contact information. Um, I know you're also working on other stuff outside of mortgages. Anything you want to share that is not NDA privilege or anything? <laughs> no, you know, I'll, all I would say is that um, um, I'm working on a couple of stuff. Like one, one thing that's kind of cool, like I'm working at this organization called Partner. Um, and what we're trying to do is partner with um, homeowners to help them build like either uh, garden suites, laneway suites, or even um, um, basement rental properties. And essentially partner takes on the responsibility of building, constructing it, and um, financing it and running the property. And uh, what we do is we essentially place like a collateral charge on the property. And then if the client decides to sell, or the homeowner decides to sell or um, refinance to take us out, then we get paid our money back plus a portion of the increased value. So that's kind of cool. Um, I'm also also working on a mutual fund trust, um, which should open in the next few months, which will allow individuals to invest um, into uh, projects. Um, and I'm gonna be working with a variety of builders and a couple of projects myself um, that um, will allow people to invest as little as $1,000 um, so some exciting stuff, but a lot of it's honestly just around empowering people to use their equity to build wealth. Because right now, I think, you know, like like Mike was saying, like, we got to help people get tapped at, a, at that unused. I call it unused capital or unused potential. All that equity that people's just sitting on and just like saying they want to die on, like, it makes no sense. Like, I've had a couple of clients like knock on wood that's passed away and um dealing with estate sales and estate um because people always think oh when i pass away i'm just gonna give my my children the house right and that's messy like that is messy and no one wants to be involved in it and there's tax implications of it but if you use the equity now to kind of push it forward to let them take advantage of it now you know i think that's the biggest opportunity we have in our community is to take advantage of that untapped potential and then doing that or and the other thing i have to say is that 
people shouldn't be shy of asking people for co-signers too because that's a big thing like that's can help you so much and sometimes people are willing to do it they just don't know the implications or what could happen so i think it's just all about positioning and i'm here to help you guys if you ever need clients and have that tough conversation or you know someone that you know their family has a lot of equity and they can use a little boost i'm very good at helping you guys and helping the the clients put that that together and why it makes sense so if you need anything hit me up and always mike always knows how to find me and um thank you for giving me the time no problem thanks jason for being here with us i know you have a 12 45 with your barber so <laughs> i gotta get there mike <laughs> so we know where to find you and how to find you um i'm gonna stay on the phone for a few more minutes, uh, just to talk to the team. Jason, you're free to, to get All right, it. thanks guys. And we'll Peace. talk to you soon, take care. So yeah, guys, so um, very, very important. I thought it was very useful and timely as well with the announcement of interest rates um, to have somebody that is involved in the space. Don't worry too much about understanding all the lingo, the Smith maneuver, the bond yields, I mean, I've heard Jason talk at least 10 times about these topics and I still don't fully grasp everything in terms of what he's saying. And I've heard and I've watched videos. So don't feel a certain type of way if you're not, if you felt that you maybe the conversation went a little bit over your head. I think the biggest takeaway that I got from this um, and I hope you guys get from this as well is on top equity serves nobody. You know, just as easily as you're, you know, a, a lot of people are watching to see what their neighbors are doing and, you know, um, to see what that new listing did, to see what their new equity is. You know, that new equity or unrealized equity means absolutely nothing unless you're selling or unless you're refinancing. Because as, as Jason mentioned, he dropped the R word recession a couple of times and then he didn't really dive into it. Uh, either, but he kind of left, you know, individuals, you know, clip hanging a little bit. So I know, you know, just think of everything as, slick, as cyclical, you know, every time, you know, especially with the type of liquidity we've had in the market over the last two years and the type of spending and access to capital, things need to adjust, things need to correct. We've seen it in the stock market, um, not necessarily saying we'll see it in the real estate market as well, but it shouldn't come as a shock to you if you know you're looking at properties in in Hamilton, Ontario, and you're looking at uh, properties in Toronto and they're priced the same. Fundamentally, that doesn't make sense. So something needs to adjust, and then that kind of adjustment, I believe, is healthy. It's healthy for the market. Uh, so don't let that be um, a scare factor to even as your clients or maybe yourselves as you go out there and you know you don't know how to lead conversations or lead clients in terms of should they buy should they list should they wait um i'm always a big proponent of you know let's tap into what is going on today because tomorrow's not promised and we can't predict who's going to go to war with who next week because all these things are going to affect um you know the way the market reacts not just in the stock market, but the real estate market as well. Uh, we know fundamentally immigration is strong, supply is low, rates are still, even, even if rates double, rates are still low at under 3.5%. I mean, that's still low. I mean, most of us, if we think about our parents buying real estate 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, I know my parents, when they bought in 99, their rate was you know, north of 6%. And nobody thought that was like a weird thing because it's, you know, banks are in the business of making money. And if at one at one percent, at two percent, there's no there's no real margins of revenue for financial institutions to make. So banks are in the business of making money. Um, understanding that one quarter of Canadians are look are, are sorry, one quarter of Canadians already own a home. So a lot of people that are buying today in today's market are already existing homeowners. And it's easier to have a conversation with individuals that are already in real estate. You know, they own real estate, they have equity in real estate and how to position them to help, you know, a family member, a friend, a son, a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter, 
those conversations are a lot easier than trying to, you know, help first time home buyers and just focus on first time home buyers. You know, there's a lot that I, I believe the government needs to do to help first time home buyers get into the market. But in terms of you guys here, you know, you guys are in the business of, of looking to make as much money as you can, you know, in this period. You guys have lives, expenses, and goals that you guys all need to meet. And it's a very competitive market. There's a lot of realtors. There's a lot of people singing the same song. Um, you know, there's a lot of discount agencies out there. This uh, conversation today is really to help you propel yourselves to be able to have, you know, macro and microeconomic conversations with your clients as well. Uh, so I'm not going to tie up today uh, too long. What I will say is we are, um, I will send out invites again to be able to do one-on-ones. I did a, couple, a few one-on-ones with some individuals on this call already. Uh, there's still, you know, a lot of you guys still need to get yourselves active and, you know, get into this market and take advantage of this market. You should be able to predict your businesses every, every quarter, every three months. So, you know, we're at the end right now of uh, Q1. And I know that most of my results that have come in in Q1 have been a direct correlation of my activities in Q4 of last year. So all the activities that I did in Q4 of last year, I'm seeing the results of it in Q1 of, of this year and of this quarter. All the activities and the preparation of your businesses and conversations um, that you're having are right now between January and March is going to be directly correlated to the kind of income you make in April, May, and June. If you're not having those conversations in this period, it's, it is not going to look good for you next quarter. And as we know, real estate is a very, real estate is not a 12 month thing. Um, you know, spring market officially maybe started about a week ago. And we know once October comes, you know, the year is a wrap. Uh, people are starting, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and, you know, they're already planning vacations and trips, especially because people have been locked down for two years and so forth. So if you think about it, your October, November, December result is going to be directly correlated to what you're doing in, in August, in July, and in September. So re really, by, the, by September, all your preparation, all your planning, all your prospecting, you know, all your marketing, it needs to show up by the end of September. And that's going to tell you how much you're going to make for the rest of the year. So the reality is for a lot of us, we have maybe about six months left to really uh, get to work, you know, start having those conversations with our network. And if you don't know how to build a pipeline, you know, reach out to me and I will help you in terms of how to build a pipeline, how to manage a pipeline, um, how to use the tools on your MLS to help you manage that as well because the, the year is not as long as you may think. Um, spring is already here. People are thinking about traveling and going out. These are all distractions that are gonna affect your bottom line. So book the one-on-ones and let's put a game plan together. Uh, let's help you guys get to, you know, becoming, you know, cap agents, which is, you know, making $150,000 plus, which doesn't do anything for the brokerage. That just, that's almost like kind of like your new baseline standard of living if you wanna stay in the city in terms of a household income and have, you know, um, in, and have like a lifestyle. I mean, we, we just saw gas prices about to hit a hundred or dollar 70 cents per liter. And that's, you know, groceries are up. So cost of living is, is not staying stagnant. So we need to be aggressive in terms of, you know, um, be in, be aggressive and be intentional in terms of what, we're looking to do and what we're looking to accomplish. So uh, for, uh, what's that, what's that saying? Proper planning for performance. I can't remember. Uh, once, once I remember, I'll, I'll drop the, uh, the line, but a friend of mine has a really good saying um, in terms of how to measure your results and how to measure your performance. Uh, but yeah, but let's connect this meeting next month in April will be in person. Uh, the location will be 6171 Conan, uh, which is the event space Dream Suites located in Mississauga. So we will send out details for that um, as we lead up to that time period. So this next team event that we'll have will be in person. 
Um, it would be great to kind of see all the new agents, talk to everybody, meet everybody, um, and you know, just kind of get together, get into the space of sharing and, and collaborating as well. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll give you guys the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, Natasha, I don't know if you have anything you wanna report or share in terms of what's going on on the admin side. If, you know, I know taxes is a big thing for a lot of people, T4s and T4As, maybe where we are with that. So I'll give about a few minutes for questions and then Natasha, you can come back and, and you can let us know if there's anything we need to connect with you about in terms of the tax portion of things. We did great this year with the taxes. So I'm really happy about that. <laughs> um, there hasn't been any complaints, but again, if there, you know, if you haven't had a chance to review it, um, take again, a look at your tax worksheet that we mailed out a few weeks ago. If you'd like me to resend, I can do that um, and just verify your numbers. But otherwise, that's been great. Shubham did a great job over this last year with inputting deals and making sure everything was correct. So we did well. Um, also, what's sort of been coming up is Broker Bay. A few of you have had listings, um, but are not familiar with how to update showings and stuff like that on Broker Bay. So please, if you do have a listing coming up, you know it's gonna. You want to bring it out next week or. Um, even just give me like a one to two day heads up, then I can organize and get on a call with you and help you list that on MLS, help you set up your showing instructions in Broker Bay, um, just so that you, you know, hit the ground running with, with your first listing. That's all I got. Congratulations to Paul. Paul did his first real estate deal last week. Uh, was on a Simon Cell challenging. Uh, but he, you know, but he he got the paperwork done, and he's still learning, and he's holding the the hand. There's a lot of hand holding through the process of assignments. So congratulations to Paul. That was just top of mind um, in that regard. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention, because a couple of people brought this up to me, uh, some of you should maybe start considering, uh, because we are talking about taxes, setting up your personal real estate corporations. So mm -hmm. you're. So your PREX, your, your PRECs, which is a professional corporation that your hard working um, ORIA, CREA, and TREP fees went to lobby the Ontario government so that that way we can have that in position. If some of you wanna learn a little bit more about what that means, what it means for you and your business, uh, we can discuss that as well when we book the one-on-ones because for 80% of you, it probably does not make sense. Uh, but but uh, for about 20% of you, it probably does make sense to set up those personal real estate corps. Uh, there's more accounting and more filing and more bookkeeping that's associated with it. So that's why it might not make sense um, for for everybody on this on this call. So that was that was the question I was going to ask. What what's the income level at which it makes sense? Um, there's no income level per se. Really, it's an individual to individual basis. Uh, depends on your expenses write-offs, do you have employees? Um, it could make sense at 50,000, uh, but for most people, it probably doesn't make sense up to uh, to about 150,000. Yeah, 150, I'd say. About 150 starts to make sense. Yeah. Um, but also because it's a corporation, you might have other incomes that you're drawn from other sources, maybe you know other side businesses and so forth. So you can group those that income, which your real estate income, to kind of just have everything kind of filed under under one place. But yeah, I think 150,000 is probably where it starts to make a little bit more sense uh, because right now as sales people and brokers, you can already write up a lot of your expenses. So it really depends what that expense chart looks like on, in your household and with, and, with, and with your business. And this does not qualify as tax advice disclaimer as well. You know, it's important to just make a note of that. But yeah, we can talk one-on-one -on -one more in an individual scenario to kind of see when and where this could make sense or could start to make sense for you as well. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you all for being here on this call. Uh, let's go out and let's work. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right, bye guys. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tasha. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.